joy that falls on our hearts when we bless the Lord. Well, today I want to talk to you about the cure for skepticism. I've been sharing conversations with Jesus. Today I want to talk about a man that Jesus met who was highly skeptical. Jesus wanted him in the company of the disciples. He helped him overcome his skepticism. And today maybe you have skeptical views on things. That's understandable. Most people go through that at times or Maybe you have family members you've tried to witness to them and they're skeptical. So we want to pray for them today. But I'll tell you, an encounter with Jesus, a personal encounter with Jesus, like happened for this man, cured his skepticism. And that's my prayer for all of you, that you'll have an encounter with Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. May you take us into this story today and reveal yourself to us. Lord, I pray for every doubt, every skeptical view that comes into people's minds that today you would speak to them and set them free. Lord, I love to every person's family to you. We all have family members that are on the fringe, not really sure what to believe. Some act as though they're hardened to the gospel. I pray that the Holy Spirit will overcome the resistance in their hearts, that they may truly know you, Father, and walk with you. Bless your word to us. We receive it as the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Recently, I was having lunch with a good friend. He served in the United States Army as a lawyer and also as a paratrooper. And I asked him, what was it like the first time you jumped out of a plane? He said, well, they took us up in a C-130. The Hercules plane carries 300 soldiers. It's when they reach the altitude, they give you an order to stand up, and everybody stands up immediately and gets in a line. Then that door of the plane opens, and you begin to file out. And he said, the person behind you checks your line. You can't see your own line. The soldier behind you, I said, check and make sure your parachute line is intact. I said, that takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? He said, yes, it does. And there's no turning back. And he said, you know, in that moment, there are no atheists. He said, you hear men pray, and if they've got a cross, they hold the cross of Jesus. And you get to that door, and they push you out. There are no atheists, he said in that moment. C.S. Lewis said even atheists have their doubts. Skepticism is one of the great challenges to a person's faith in God. We're living in an age of skepticism, but that's nothing new. Skepticism has always been the enemy of the faith of humanity. What does skepticism mean? Skepticism is more than having questions or critical thinking, which is so important in life. Skepticism is far deeper than that. Skepticism means to doubt the truth. To doubt the truth. In philosophy, the term skepticism is used to describe the belief that certain types of knowledge are impossible to gain. And we live in a skeptical age. We hear even in our own great nation, there is a growing deterioration of spirituality, a diminishing of faith in God. Even more people are claiming to be atheist or agnostic. There seems to be a growing skepticism even in this great nation. And the answer for skepticism is an encounter with Jesus and an experience with God. Skepticism has never accomplished anything worthwhile in the world. There's nothing that's ever been invented, discovered, developed, built by a skeptical person. Everything in this world that is good and wholesome, that enriches our lives, exists because somebody somewhere believed. There are no benefits to skepticism, but there are great benefits to faith in God. One day, Jesus met a skeptical man. His name was Nathaniel. The Bible tells us of this story and their encounter and their brief conversation. John chapter 1, verse 43 through 50, we read, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip there and said, follow me. Philip went and found Nathaniel and said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and of whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, 
Nazareth, he said, can anything good come from there? Philip said, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Nathaniel was a man who struggled with skepticism, as we see in our world today, as you will confront at times, perhaps even in your own heart or in a relationship with someone you're trying to help or to lead to Christ. You may go into an environment that is very antagonistic to your faith. Our young people sometimes go into environments in the world that are raised to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're, they're confronted sometimes with skepticism. But I want to encourage you, especially young people, you never have to be intimidated by somebody's skepticism. Just because somebody has a question about something doesn't change your answer to the question. Skepticism is doubt of the truth. The truth is God does exist. The truth is Jesus is the Savior of the world. The truth is the Word of God is true and reliable and the promises of God are yes and amen. That's the truth. So skepticism, especially for our young people, should never unravel anyone's faith. But God puts you in that moment, with, even with a skeptical person, to make a difference in their life. And sometimes people get into environments or young people go to an educational environment where there's a professor perhaps that's adversarial to the faith and think they know everything. And that can be very intimidating. It's like a young man who went to college for the first year who took a religion course. And the professor was basically against all religions. And so he kind of had a negative view of religion. And he started talking about the Bible one day. He said, you can't really accept the miracles of the Bible as legitimate Take, for example, the parting of the Red Sea. This, there was no miracle there when the Hebrew slaves came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. He said the fact is that at certain points of the year, the Red Sea is very low. It gets down to about two feet of water. And what really happened was Moses and the Israelites just waded across the Red Sea at that time, and that was their deliverance. It wasn't a great miracle. And this young man who was a committed Christian, he said, praise the Lord. Professor said, what you're so happy about? I've just explained to you that it's, it's not a great miracle. It's just a natural coincidence, an occurrence. And he said, no, I'm praising God, not about the parting of the water. I'm just praising God over the miracle that God drowned Pharaoh and his entire army in only two feet of water. It's all on how you look at it. It's all on how you look at it. If you dismiss God, you won't see him. If you believe God exists, you'll begin to see and experience God. It's all how you look at it. But a person's view on life does not change the truth. And here was a man that was introduced to Jesus by his friend, Philip. Now, Philip and Nathaniel, they grew up in the Galilee. Peter and Andrew, and James and John, all grew up in this same region. I've been to that part of the world. We've been there on several Bible study tours. Nazareth, it's all right next to each other. Capernaum, where the disciples live. Bethsaida, of the region. Cain of Galilee, where he turned the water to wine. All these are little towns, and they're all still there. So he was familiar. And at this moment, he was invited by a friend to come and meet the Messiah. And he was skeptical of what he heard. And why was Nathaniel skeptical? What was he skeptical about? When he was on his way to meet Jesus, he already had his mind made up. You ever met anybody like that? You try to have a conversation, they already got their mind made up. They're not going to hear anything, they're going to argue. They're ready to fight about it. The good quality about Nathaniel is that he didn't completely close his mind. He still was willing enough to go. And in that moment, Jesus revealed himself to him. 
And what were the causes of his skepticism? And what are the causes of skepticism today? Well, first of all, Philip was skeptical of the gospel. He was skeptical of the good news. He said, we found the Messiah. That seemed too simple. If the Messiah had come, surely the whole world would know about it. The Messiah would make a grand entry, wouldn't he? They've been hearing about the Messiah for hundreds of years in the synagogues from the rabbi. They talk about one day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to bring hope for the world. And the rabbis told him that the Messiah is going to be a prophet. He's going to be a priest of God like Aaron. He's going to be the king of Israel like King David. He's coming with a great powerful kingdom. And it seemed too simple that the Messiah was already here and nobody noticed that's it. We found the Messiah. That's how easy it is. I just got to go and meet him. You see, people are skeptical because in their minds, the gospel seems too simple. People want a complicated religion. We want those rituals. We want the good works. We want the penance. We want to work our way and climb our way up the stairway to heaven so we feel better about ourselves. And many people are skeptical of the simplicity of the gospel, the good news. The Messiah has come. Come and see him. Come and meet him. Come and receive him into your life. Can we really believe Romans 10 verse 9? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that it? Right after Jesus fed the 5,000, a crowd came to him in John chapter 6 verse 28 and 29. They said, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus said the work God requires is to believe in the one whom he has sent. That's it. They asked him about works. They wanted a bunch of works. He answers with the one work. Believe in the one whom God has sent. Can we really believe Ephesians 2 verse 8? For by grace are you saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Surely it can't be that simple. Well, you stop and think about that for a minute. Everything significant in your life started with one simple decision. And the decision to believe in Jesus is going to lead to your deliverance from sin and judgment and fear and going to lead you into your destiny. There's nothing that exists in the universe that starts in a state of complexity. Everything moves from simple to complex. When you go to first grade, they don't teach you physics. I don't think they should ever teach it personally. That should be after school hours because knowledge starts simple and it moves to complex. The gospel is simple, but that one beginning point, that life-changing decision, the moment I met Barbie, I fell in love with her. I would have gotten married the next morning. Look what that one simple decision has cost me. <laughs> the greatest life ever. The gospel is supposed to be simple. Everything real starts at a state of simplicity, a simple act of faith. I know Jesus is God's son. I don't know everything about the Bible, but I know who Jesus is. Lord, I trust you as my Savior. That decision will now deliver you from the law of sin and death and put you on the destiny that God has for your life. And second of all, he was skeptical of the testimony of Philip. Philip said, we found the Messiah. Philip was all excited because he had met Jesus. He'd come to an understanding of who Jesus is, and he came and he shared his testimony. But Nathaniel was skeptical of his testimony. And he said, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's ready to argue with him. And Philip said, come and see. Philip didn't keep pushing his testimony. He didn't argue. He just said, come and see. You see, your life is a living testimony. The gospel is not an argument. It is a testimony. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. He says, you are letters known and read by everyone. You are a letter from Christ. Think about that. When you accept Jesus 
You become a letter written by Jesus to your family to read the story of your life. You're a letter to the place where you work. You're a letter to everybody in your school. Your life is a living letter, a living testimony, and it has power in people's lives. And people may not accept it at first. They may come up with skeptical observations. They may say, well, that's great for you, but not great for everybody else, just like Nathaniel did. Don't argue with them. Just say, come and see. Read the Bible for yourself. Ask God to reveal himself to you. Come to church with me. Come and see. Bring them into an environment where suddenly they can have an encounter with God. Your life is a living testimony, and it is powerful. Your testimony is so powerful that it overcomes evil. That's why the book of Revelation, in Revelation 12, verse 10, 11, has this vision of this great red dragon. He represents the devil. and He's raging at humanity and raging against God's people. And how do we overcome evil? Revelation 12, verse 11 says of the church of believers, they overcame him, the devil, by the word of their testimony. Your testimony is powerful and life-changing. And you don't have to try to convince anybody or argue with anybody to say, here's my story. Come and see for yourself. And third of all, he objected and was skeptical of the Bible. Philip quotes the Bible to him. We have found the one Moses wrote about, the written scripture, the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses. Is Jesus in the Pentateuch? Absolutely. Jesus is in every page and sentence and nook and cranny of the Old Testament. It's all a story of the Redeemer who's coming. And he said he's also written about in the prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea. But Philip was skeptical of the scripture, of the Bible, of the written word of God. Did you know that in the Old Testament there are about 300 prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. That's how the Magi, for example, knew to go all the way from Persia to Bethlehem because it's foretold 500 years earlier in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. You say, well, I thought they saw a star. Yeah, the star confirmed the scripture. They knew the scripture first from the Jews that had been exiled there a few hundred years earlier, and it taught them. They knew right in the Bible where the Messiah would be born. That's why they went to Bethlehem. The star only confirmed the scripture. The Bible is the most purchased book, the most read book, the most persecuted book. It's been banned. It's been outlawed. It's been discredited. And all the skepticism seems to pass with time, and the Word of God endures forever. The Bible really is the most interesting book I've ever read. I've read a number of textbooks even helped write a few. I wouldn't go back and read one of those books. I read all those books just to pass the test. But every time I open the Bible, it speaks to me. Something new, something different. It's amazing. It's a different book. It's the inspired, enduring word of God. And Philip said, the scriptures are telling us what's happening in history. But he was skeptical of the scripture. But if you open your mind to the scripture, his word will bring you life. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Read it. Believe it. It will speak to you. The word of God. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is set on heaven. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Your word is truth. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 16, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, The word of God is living and active. I remember early in our ministry, we were invited one night to go to a Gideon's banquet. This is an organization that distributes Bibles all over the world. They put them in hotels at times. They Go to go to public schools. I had for many, many years a Gideon's New Testament, a little bright green New Testament they gave me in Park Lane Elementary School. I, I carried that all the way through even college and even in my ministry, that little Gideon's Bible. So we went to this banquet where they were raising support for the Gideon's ministry and we were awed by the testimony of the woman that got up. Her name was Elizabeth. She told her own story what a broken life she had lived. Everything in her life had fallen apart. A divorce and kids that didn't like her anymore. One of her children had committed suicide. She shared one of the most dejected, depressed stories of a person. She worked for a doctor in an office, and he was a Christian man and had given her a New Testament. 
And written a note in there to her at the beginning, a personal note, and put these little sticky notes in there just for a few scriptures to read and told her that the word of God would help her. She never opened it. She didn't read it. She didn't believe it. She was skeptical. One night when they closed the office and everybody left, she said, well, I'll close up. I got some work to do. She had every intention that night of overdosing and ending her life. She was so despondent. And when I heard her story, I understood how she could be there. And she said she was about to take a medication, and she noticed that Bible that he had left for her. And so she took it down and for some reason opened it up, and he had written her the nicest, kindest note personally of how he cared about her and how Jesus could change her life. And she began to look at those sticky notes, and she began to read those scriptures of all have sinned and fallen short. And she read about how God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. She read that she could confess her sins and that Jesus would give her eternal life, and there as little as she knew, she asked God to help her and to save her and gave her life to Christ. And she came to tell everybody of the power of the word of the living God. And then he was skeptical of the town. He said, Nazareth, that podunk town, that rundown shell of what it used, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Maybe there was the rumor of the time that nothing ever good comes out of Nazareth. Maybe nothing ever good ever came out of it. He knew that town. He grew up in that town, around that town. When he said we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, he was skeptical over the humility of the gospel. The Messiah could not possibly come from Nazareth, you know why we miss God? Because we have such God in the box thinking. And if God didn't do things the way we thought he was going to do it or the way the church told us, we miss it. That's why all those Pharisees and teachers of the law missed all those 300 prophets. The Magi figured it out because they didn't have religious notions. But the rabbis couldn't even figure out that he'd be born in Bethlehem. And it's written in the book. All right, have their minds made up. If Messiah comes, it's not going to be from Nazareth. It's going to be from Jerusalem, the city of David, the king. He's a, supposed to be a messianic king of the line of David. He's got to come from Jerusalem, or maybe he's going to come from Hebron down south, where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the, the patriarchs are buried, the historical site of the patriarch. He's got to come from Hebron, perhaps the father of our faith, or maybe come from the city of Rome that ruled the world. Nazareth, there's no way God can do anything great with Nazareth. The same skepticism people have about the cross. We want a Messiah in the heavens. We want a Messiah on the throne. We want a Messiah running for office. We want a Messiah who's a billionaire of a corporation. But a Messiah on a cross? God could take something so simple and horrific. And Jesus offer his life in a mystery of atonement. And pray, Father, forgive them. And the cross becomes the place where the world finds redemption from its sin. The only sinless son of God who ever walked the face of the earth, who took our sins and took our judgment and pardoned the world. It is simple and beyond comprehension, but it is true. You can go to any shrine of any philosopher, any great prophet you want to. You're not going to find salvation there. You can worship at the altar of any gods you want. You're going to leave as empty as you came. But if you ever go to the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I receive your cleansing blood for my sins and walk away forgiven and free, you'll know the power of the cross. The only place you can find redemption is at the foot of a cross. Yes, the Messiah came from Nazareth, a podunk, meaningless town. And yes, God redeemed the world at Calvary on a cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us it is the power of God. And once you have been to the cross and you know the power of his grace and forgiveness and love, you are changed forever. And he was skeptical of the person. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, I know him. I remember him. I remember his father's carpentry shop. He 
You're telling me the Messiah came from a carpenter shop? My mother used to love this statement. You've heard it perhaps. She said this a lot to me about relationships. She said, familiarity breeds contempt. You ever heard that? Well, that's what happened to Nathaniel. I'm familiar with his family. I know that shop. You see, that's why people sometimes go to church for years, and next thing you know, they, they start taking it for granted, and they notice all the hypocrites in the church, which I don't know why that stops anybody from coming. We got room for one more. They get familiar with the church. They get familiar with the Bible. They get familiar with the songs. And skepticism creeps in. You're telling me the carpenter's son is the Messiah? The son of Joseph? You know, Jesus went back to his hometown once. Man, he'd been out preaching parables and miracles. Jesus was known everywhere at this point. So he goes back to his little town. And he goes in the synagogue on Sunday. I've been to that synagogue. We've been to the ruins of that synagogue. And he begins to get up and speak and share the word of God. He was a rabbi. And the people in the town said, where did this man get all this learning? And then somebody said, isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't his mother Mary with us and his brothers and sisters? And they took offense at him. They were offended by Jesus. They were skeptical because they were familiar. And that's where Jesus said, you know, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. Skepticism comes from familiarity. And we miss the power of God. And the end of that story of Nazareth, this is found in Mark 6, 1 through 6. It says that Jesus could do no miracles there except heal a few sick people because of their unbelief. And Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. And I think God looks at this world that has been given so much, so much blessing, so much life and our generation, so much we've experienced and yet, growing skepticism toward the Almighty. And I think God is amazed at our lack of faith. I think at times Jesus walks through his churches and might be amazed at their lack of faith. And that was Nathaniel. Too familiar. But the fact of the matter is, God did share our humanity. He was the son of Joseph. He came in the world like the rest of us, but he was more than a man. He was God in the flesh. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The word became flesh and lived among us, and we saw his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. And some people can't look past the humanity of Jesus. They say, yeah, he was a man. He was a man like us. He was a good man. He was a great teacher, maybe the greatest teacher. He was a master of parables, maybe he invented parables. He even worked miracles. He was a great psychologist and counselor, and they stopped there. Yes, he was all those things, but he is more. He is the son of the living God, the savior of the world. God in human form. Irenaeus, the early church father who lived in the second century, said, God became what we are, that we might become what he is. Jesus came right down here with us. Well, how did Jesus cure the skepticism? How can you cure your skepticism? Well, the first thing that happened was the affirmation of Jesus. So Nathaniel comes with all these objections. He's ready for an argument. <laughs> He's got his own scriptures. Why, well, this can't be true. And as soon as he walks up, Jesus sees him coming and says to everyone, here's a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, Jesus is stretching the truth to say that because we all know all have sinned. What a compliment. Did you know you can't win the people you insult? The first thing Jesus did was compliment him. That caught him off guard. He affirmed him. 
You see, Jesus knew who he was. He knew what was in his heart. He knew the good. He knew the bad about him. And he loved him and he wanted him in his own company. I want to tell you today, there are words in my vocabulary for me to explain to you how much God loves you. And Jesus wants you to follow him. Jesus wants you. I think that the root of skepticism, spiritual skepticism, is a feeling that people have that God doesn't really love them and he doesn't want them. And when Nathaniel walked up, he shocked him. Jesus already saw into his heart and he wanted him and he loved him and he complimented him. If you're of a different religion, I would never insult you or your religion. I've studied your religion. If you have no faith, an atheist, agnostic, I know people that listen to me preach. They like to hear me preach. They have very little faith. I would never insult you. People are where they are in life for a reason. You can't win the people you insult. So Jesus gave him a compliment. He saw the good in him. Praise the good. Mother Teresa, who spent her life among the poor of the poorest in India, she worked among lepers as well. She once said that the greatest disease in the world is not leprosy or tuberculosis. It is the feeling of being unwanted. And many young people today feel like God doesn't love them or feel like they're unwanted. There's no place for them. I want to tell you today, especially young people, God loves you with an everlasting love and God has an amazing plan for your life. God knows everything about you. You may feel like you're the worst sinner here today or watching me. God knows everything about you. He said, I know, I know your heart condition, Nathaniel. God knows the good and the bad, but God wants you just like you are. You don't need a religion to fix you up. You need redemption to change your life. And that love of Jesus overcame that skepticism. You got a bunch of skeptical friends just saying, people in my family, don't argue with them. Show them affection. And then there was the predestination of God. This stunned him. And let me comment on it for a moment. Jesus said, the answer to the question, he said, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. It never met. And Jesus said, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Think about that. Jesus said, I saw you before this moment. Now, if I were to ask you when you got saved and you accepted Christ, you could think about that and probably tell your story. But I'm going to tell you long before you came to that place, Jesus saw you long before that. Think about the predestination of God on your life. That's what David celebrated in Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. Listen carefully. He said of God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed body. That's the Hebrew word embryo. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David realized you saw me before this moment. You saw me in my mother's womb. And when God spoke to Jeremiah to be a prophet, he had wanted any part of that. He said, I'm too young. What did God tell him? He didn't feel qualified. He didn't feel like he was prophet material. What did God tell him in his heart? Jeremiah 1 verse 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He writes, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. What did Paul tell us about God's predestination? Listen to Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 5. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In his love, he predestined us. Predestination has nothing to do with heaven or hell. Predestination means a plan worked out in advance. Predestination does not mean some people are sovereignly chosen to perish in eternity and others go to heaven. Such an idea is an affront to the gospel of Christ and to the very nature of God who is love. There's no way that God who is love would create people and predestine their eternal outcome. Predestination is not about the people. It's about the plan of God. It is the cross that was predestined. It was the plan of God that was predetermined. Christ died before the 
foundation of the world, the apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 18, it is the plan who is predestined and the plan includes everybody. God planned for your salvation. God planned for you to be here today, hearing this message right now. God knew you before this moment. This is not a conversation between me and you. This is a conversation between you and Jesus. That's who's at work here, is Jesus is searching your heart, letting you know that he loves you and he wants you and he is true and he is real. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing. The next time somebody tells you that God has elected certain people for heaven and others for judgment or for annihilation or whatever they want to say, that is not true. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has already made up his decision about you. Jesus has already made up his decision about you. Today is your time to say, Lord, I receive you. And that's what happened to Nathaniel. When he realized that Christ wanted him and that God loved him and that his life had been predetermined, he immediately changed his tune. He said, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. He made his confession, a simple confession, a simple decision changed his destiny. And Jesus said, you will see greater things than this. And when you follow Jesus and you trust God, you will see great things in your life. Would you join me for prayer this morning? I want to tell you something. If you want to look at me, you can look at me. I want to tell you something. This series of sermons, this is the seventh, is one of the most interesting and unique messages the Lord has given to me when I've read these stories, seen things I've never seen before. I feel like I've been preaching an evangelistic crusade for seven Sundays so that none of you would be lost or away from Christ. Or if you've fallen away, like many go through ups and downs, this has been a season for you to know how much God loves you and to make your confession and dedication to say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. And I want to lead you in a prayer today that you could make that decision if you haven't made it. I baptized a few minutes ago. We had 15 people baptized, and a woman came in there, and she said, Pastor, she said, I'm coming to rededicate my life to Christ today. I thought, well, we all need that on certain occasions, a fresh start. And maybe today you need to renew your commitment to Jesus. Then follow me in this prayer. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I, like Nathaniel, declare you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I receive your atonement for my sins. I open my heart to you today and pray that you will save me by your grace. Lord, I believe in you. I trust you. I dedicate myself to you today and fulfill your destiny, Lord, in my life, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we leave this call Thank you for joining us for worship today. The Bible says we should worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. What an amazing time we've had together. I wanna ask you to do me a favor. Make sure you download the Mount Perrin apps today on your phone if you don't have it already. You can see all the sermons and the worship and all the ministries and events of the church as well. And let me ask you to subscribe to my sermon podcast and share the sermons with others and become part of the weekly Bible study that I offer 15 minutes a week that'll change your life as we study the Word of God together. Next weekend is Labor Day weekend. We've got a great service planned. I trust that you and your family can be with us for worship, but not here on campus, certainly online. We've got a great morning plan together. Thank you for your generous and faithful support of the ministry of the church. Your giving makes all the difference in the world so that we can continue to give the world hope in Christ. We're praying for you here at Mount Perry and all the pastors and I. We lift you up every week that God will bless you and your family richly. I trust that you'll have a wonderful day.